Hello and welcome everyone to this roundtable on Bridge the Gap in Education. I'm very, very honored to be your host today. My name is Dr. Constantine Kiritsis, and I will be your host trying to control and coordinate the event. I'm very, very proud to be part of this. And uh, I just a few more uh, points to tell you before we begin this about the housekeeping issues. It's very important to know that if something goes wrong, you can refresh, of course, you can send your questions through the system we have. And of course, if someone wants to review the whole event, we will give you the link uh, after the event is concluded. So a few more points. I want to all uh, wish all of you, uh, I hope everyone is good in health. This is a very, very difficult time with the pandemic and we appreciate that. And we want to welcome all of you and hope all of you are well. Uh, we have people joining us from uh, all over the world and many of you come from the United States and Europe and, uh, and Asia, Middle East, Africa. And we are honestly privileged and honored to be being able to, to produce this for you. We have a great line uh, of, of individuals, a great lineup, and uh, I, I'm not going to take too much time. I just want to mention the names. We have uh, Dr. Harry Patrinos from the World Bank, and I'll tell you more, of course, when we begin. We have uh, uh, Nicholas Piachot, who is, of course, from the Varki Foundation, who's done a tremendous job, uh, the Varki Foundation around the world, and not only in the Middle East. We have Alexa Joyce, who is from Microsoft, and Microsoft has been one of the cornerstones of uh, companies that actually have done amazing, amazing work for, for everyone around the world in this very, very delicate area of education. And we have, of course, uh, Mr. Stelios Christakos, who is the CEO of, of, of the Sophia Education Experts, very, very uh, knowledgeable uh, in, in the area of not only technology, but education and technology. And of course, the founder uh, who would probably who would speak last, but uh, not least least uh, Mr. Konstantinos Dukas, who is the founder of School of, of the Future International Academy. So we have a great lineup. Stay tuned, stay with us, and uh, I will try to coordinate the questions. Please keep information coming in, and I will do my best to make sure I can group them, group the questions, and make sure uh, you have time to, to, to listen to the answers. So uh, without further ado, I want to invite the, the, the first, of course, the first uh, speaker, Dr. Harry Patrinos, who is uh, the practice manager in education uh, for the World Bank uh, for the Central and Eastern uh, and, and, and Asian region. He, he is very, very knowledgeable in the area, has done amazing work through the World Bank in a, in a number of different, of course, capacities. And he knows uh, I'm not going to mention all of them. So Dr. Patrinos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this invitation and opportunity to speak. I, I hope everyone can see my uh, my presentation. Yes. Thank you. And uh, again, um, good to, to meet on this very important topic at a, a critical juncture uh, in the attempt to um, reboot the education systems and um, uh, repair uh, some of the uh, damage done by the school closures due to uh, COVID-19. As, as we as we all know, by the um, uh, by by the spring of uh, of this year, most school systems uh, around the world had to um, had to be closed because of the uh, health uh, issues due to the uh, pandemic and safety of children and uh, and their families. According to UNESCO, more than 1.5, 1.6 billion students at, at one time uh, were out of school. So the biggest um, event, uh, certainly in our lifetimes, to affect education uh, worldwide. We know from past uh, episodes, past pandemics, uh, that these have tremendous uh, e economic and social effects. Um, Black Death back in the 14th century, 75 million dead. Uh, and of course, an impact on uh, labor markets with a tremendous reduction of labor, especially in urban areas, but the higher agricultural wages. Uh, Spanish flu, uh, a bit more recently, um, more than 100 million dead and uh, several um, impacts on social economic uh, outputs. 
In fact, research published just before COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, began showed that even up until the 1980s, uh, those uh, uh, children that were born um, during or were in utero during the uh, Spanish flu suffered so social and socioeconomic effects, uh, including lower levels of education, lower income. So pandemics affect economic output in the current year, as we know, but also have a long, long term effect on social and economic development. Uh, income is one area. We, we've already seen estimates of the loss of GDP this year. Uh, and what I wanted to share uh, today is that uh, the impacts on uh, national income as a result of lost learning uh, are likely to be with us for a long time and will be larger in impact than current year uh, income losses. The way that we categorize the costs of the school closures, uh, there are two main categories. One is the learning loss. If people aren't, aren't in school, then presumably they're missing out on um, on, on their education and uh, all of us here today, I'm sure believe that uh, education and the uh, presence of children in the classroom does lead to learning gain. So therefore, uh, by definition, less access to schooling should reduce uh, learning, unfortunately. And the other longer term impact is uh, what happens when uh, these uh, students, these children and, and uh, youth enter the labor market with the lost uh, education uh, what happens to them in terms of uh, the jobs they get, uh, the earnings uh, that they will um, uh, generate. We've already seen many uh, predictions, simulations, and modeling of the potential impact of the school closures on the education system. Uh, the World Bank published in the summer its uh, projections of what the uh, school closures would mean in terms of uh, lost uh, lost learning uh, and proficiency levels and taking different um, uh, scenarios, uh, uh, optimistic to pessimistic, uh, meaning large impacts or re relatively small ones. And even in the uh, most optimistic scenarios, a learning loss was expected and an increase in those students falling below the minimum proficiency level, which According to PISA, the OECD, these minimum levels are effectively functional illiteracy. So these are disturbing numbers, even if only the optimistic scenario was to be uh, realized. And as we've seen, even when these uh, projections were made, uh, the estimates then were of a, maybe a four month uh, school closure. We've seen longer school closures in many systems around the world. For Europe and Central Asia, our estimates suggest uh, significant learning losses, even in the optimistic scenario of at least a 3% uh, uh, loss in terms of learning adjusted years of schooling, a measure that uh, takes into consideration lost schooling in terms of quantity. Uh, you have four or five months less schooling and how much learning you lose in terms of what you can do as measured in cognitive tests. So losing up to a year of education as a result of the school closures. One might say, how could you lose a year when the schools were only closed for four or five months? And the answer is it's a combined effect of the, the cognitive learning loss and the years of education. Both have an impact on ultimate learning attainment. And for the at least the Northern Hemisphere countries, the school closures coincided with the spring uh, breaks in some countries and then uh, summer uh, breaks for, for all countries. And we know that the summer summers are associated also with learning losses as well. The uh, average scores are, are likely to go down from about 460 in Europe to up to, four, to 430, so almost 30 points uh, really almost a year's worth of learning uh, could be lost as a result of the uh, crisis. Again, these are predictions and I'll come to what we're actually finding uh, in the world. Now, the, the way to mitigate these uh, learning losses, of course, is to do what every uh, country did and, and to put in place its distance education system. Some have re referred to the efforts as really 
emergency week, remote teaching because no country was prepared for uh, massive school closures that would result in all of their students uh, from pre pre-kindergarten to university to be out of school. And in most countries, there is a limited capacity to uh, to uh, put in motion a distance uh, education system that would uh, be available to all. Also, in all countries, there are segments of the population with uh, less connectivity, whether it's because of um, um, access to the internet or access to um, uh, the uh, digital equipment needed. Uh, we do expect weak uh, student connectivity in at least some parts of every country. And given the lack of uh, connectivity in some countries, there were efforts to extend learning through television. Uh, we have countries that use radio. We have countries that use the postal service uh, to, stay, uh, to keep learning um, uh, continuity. And of course, uh, these methods reduce the level of interaction between teacher and student and therefore affect the quality of education. The reports early on from the highest income countries were of relatively poor attendance to the distance education classes. Uh, large levels in some uh, large cities in North America, uh, Europe, uh, and the like, uh, particularly of, of high school students that uh, just uh, were not interested in the uh, type of education that was going on. So all these factors tend to uh, blunt the effect of the mitigation efforts. And I would say that governments made very strong uh, heroic efforts to, to provide uh, learning continuity. It's just that no one was prepared for massive uh, schooling uh, closures. So there's been several estimates of the uh, economic costs, um, predicting uh, using past um, uh, uh, crises as examples or modeling uh, the system. Uh, probably the, the first one that I saw was in uh, Norway uh, that suggested large uh, learning um, losses that would uh, extend uh, as uh, uh, more uh, as the closures uh, continued. Uh, U.S. there are several indicators uh, suggesting that uh, especially those in higher education could lose up to $80,000 as a result of four months of school closures. Uh, the estimates, of course, uh, varied by um, the level of education, but at least a uh, nine to 10% reduction in future earnings. Studies in the UK suggesting that each, um, uh, each uh, month of school closures would reduce um, earnings by about 3% uh, a year. The estimates in Canada suggest that uh, if, if unemployment levels increase, there will be uh, a significant loss of maybe 20% earnings for those students entering the labor market uh, during uh, the crisis induced by uh, COVID. Global estimates um, we discussed and um, the World Bank's estimate is that in terms of lost lifetime earnings for students as a result of the school closures could be 10 trillion dollars over uh, a long period of time. So large, large impacts from a variety of countries and uh, global estimates from the bank. Our estimate um, extended the World Bank analysis to bring in higher education. The, uh, the estimate I mentioned of $10 trillion was only for primary and secondary education. Our estimates uh, include higher education, more difficult to do. We don't have a a test. So these are actually underestimates of the potential loss of future GDP as a result of the school closure. So we, when we bring in higher education, it could be 12 to 18 percent of future GDP, much larger number than uh, others have been have been showing. We also estimate the impacts by uh, uh, income level of the country and for individuals. Uh, the present value loss of, uh, uh, of learning are about $2,000 over a lifetime. Doesn't sound like a lot of uh, money, but keep in mind these are low income countries uh, and $2,000 uh, could be quite devastating for uh, the individuals and their families. 
the estimates rise to uh, 6,721,000 in high income countries. And at the global level, it's about $11,000. So that doesn't sound like very much given the kinds of numbers we talk about globally. But remember, there are 1.5 billion students affected by the school closures. When we multiply these, we get much larger uh, numbers. The global impact could be $11 trillion over the lifetime of these uh, 1.5 uh, billion students. And these estimates, of course, are assuming a four month school closure. And we know some countries it was longer than four months. So again, these are conservative estimates. The number sounds small in low income countries, but given the level of income in low income countries, this is a devastating number. The largest losses are for middle income countries at 6.8 trillion. That's because most students in the world are in a middle income country. So that's where we're likely to see uh, big, uh, the biggest impacts, but the global impacts are large. Looking at the, the losses by level of education, uh, two, two facts come out. Of course, uh, earnings are higher at the tertiary level, so those losses could be much uh, higher at the tertiary level, but the losses at the primary and secondary level are also high when you keep in mind the, 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 the potential earnings of students with only a primary or secondary education. We also know from crises that those with tertiary education can protect themselves from uh, either from job loss or from total income losses. And we've seen larger losses in crises for those with secondary education and below. So we expect a distributional effect that will favor those with tertiary education and will favor those from a higher socioeconomic background. By, um, by definition, then those with less than tertiary and those from poor socioeconomic backgrounds will suffer more, as has been the case in um, uh, past crises that we've seen. So we do expect a differentiated effect um, primarily because educational attainment increases cognitive skills and those with much higher levels of education, higher cognitive skills could suffer less. Uh, and those who are more educated are better able to cope, uh, both because employers may be reluctant to let go of uh, highly skilled um, uh, prepared um, uh, workers and might be more likely to dismiss those with lower levels of education. So again, we see um, a, a potential response that would favor uh, those with higher levels of education. Also, those with more uh, with higher levels of schooling may have uh, information channels that will allow them to move within jobs, within say the 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 enterprise, or uh, change jobs and be more protected. So we do expect the differentiated effect. Uh, how do we know that? Um, uh, I'll, I'll come to this in a moment. We also know from uh, past uh, crises that the returns to education, the relative pay of those with more and less education, let's say those with university versus secondary, this tends to increase during crises. Uh, Argentina with several periods of economic crises, and we're expecting a recession uh, of, um, of, of its larger, or larger proportions uh, to come. So in Argentina, we know that um, as incomes overall plummeted, the relative pay between those with higher education secondary actually increased. So favors those with higher levels of education. We saw the same thing in Mexico um, during uh, crises. There seemed to be a, a, a growth in the um, uh, in the in the pay premium to those with higher education, and this continued into um, into the future. Same pattern, Venezuela, many different. Uh, crises over time, uh, but the relative pay of those with university versus secondary tends to remain high and actually increased in the latest uh, crisis. Uh, we saw the same pattern in Greece, a uh, very um, uh, important study by Jolesas and, and others showing that uh, as overall national income levels uh, decrease, decrease significantly, uh, the relative pay of those with um, uh, higher levels of schooling tended to increase slightly over time and has, has been maintained ever since. So the advantages 
uh, occur during the crisis, but they tend to uh, remain after crisis. And just to make the point that it is a loss of earnings of those with secondary and below, uh, the case of Argentina is shown again, but here you can see uh, the growth of the returns to tertiary education compared to what's happening for secondary education. The drop is, uh, is at the secondary level, and this tends to give a higher return to those with higher education. It doesn't mean they're earning more during the crisis, it just means that the relative earnings are higher for those with university education. And this points to uh, a potential problem even post COVID, post COVID recession, that inequality uh, may, may increase, increase significantly. And we're coming to the point where for the first time in history, education will actually contribute to growing inequality rather than contributing to equity. So we know in Europe, uh, there's been several attempts to, to study what's actually happened. Because until now I've talked about predictions and uh, theory, uh, but we do have some evidence coming in. Uh, we know uh, from the countries where, where I work in Europe and Central Asia, there have been tremendous uh, efforts to extend uh, distance education. Uh, we also get reports that uh, some students are, are left out because the lack of access to the internet, lack of access to uh, digital equipment. Countries have made efforts by providing education via uh, broadcast, television, I mentioned also radio has been used, and in some cases in remote areas, the postal system. But we are seeing evidence now, and it's come from uh, representative studies in Germany and Switzerland to show that the significant reduction in time devoted to study during the lockdown. So even though uh, the students are connected, there are lessons being broadcast, uh, internet and television, uh, students are spending less time uh, studying. Uh, we are, have received also the first um, signs of learning loss uh, from actual surveys that compare students just before the crisis and now that the schools have reopened. Uh, in Belgium, we saw a significant decline in, um, in learning levels. We also saw a significant decline in learning levels in the Netherlands. Much smaller in the Netherlands, but it was a shorter lockdown period in the Netherlands. So the learning losses are pretty much what was predicted by the World Bank um, in terms of uh, absolute levels. What we didn't uh, know is how uh, devastating this is for uh, poorer segments of society. So in both Netherlands and Belgium, larger, much larger learning losses for those from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. A similar uh, study in the UK showed that uh, students are much less uh, prepared than they were a year ago, and part of this is due uh, to the crisis as well. And just last week from the United States, from the city of Dallas in Texas, um, learning losses of about uh, affecting 30% of the population. So the evidence suggests that those predictions are falling more in the pessimistic side of what the World Bank uh, predicted. So we're seeing learning losses, we're seeing large learning losses, significant learning losses, and much larger for those from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, just to uh, repeat the point. And we expect this to come out in studies that we know are, are coming from, uh, from middle income countries and from some lower income countries. More, more data will come in. It would be surprising uh, not to see uh, significant learning uh, losses. So we're, we're seeing less schooling, less um, uh, effort uh, taking place, and now significant uh, learning losses from several countries in Europe, and now for the first time from the uh, United States. So what can we do about this? Distance education is definitely uh, part of the solution, but um, it's not enough. Uh, I think the systems have been put in place in some countries that have a, either continued an online uh, presence or a mixed presence have improved. Uh, so we do need to build the capacity of the distance education system. But what do you do about the students that have lost learning? There is uh, hope from some uh, studies showing that uh, high dosage tutoring, as it's called in the United States, uh, many studies, many rigorous studies have taken place to show that this can help uh, reduce learning losses and 
uh, help students catch up to where they should be. So tutoring has been put in place in several countries. Uh, the literature suggests this is a, a promising um, intervention. The other is to use assessments to inform teachers on how they can improve learning outcomes and uh, address the learning losses for those students that have fallen further behind. But we need information and we need the information to get to teachers uh, at the front lines. An effective response would require uh, uh, connectivity, both emergency and to improve the IT infrastructure, uh, production of high quality digital content to go along uh, with the uh, efforts that, that are taking place. And we've seen in, in, uh, in most countries the need to build the institutional capacity that will provide the response during the closures, but also in the recovery and to build a system that's resilient uh, to the kinds of uh, events that may take place again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, let me just check if the, if the voice, if we're okay with the sound. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patrinos. Uh, amazing. Uh, lots of good information and lots of info on what's going on on a global scale. I know the work of the World Bank is uh, is, is very important. Uh, a couple of points that uh, come out of this, and I want just to share uh, just a minute of points, and then we can we can proceed with the second presentation. One is the uh, is the amazing uh, the amazing point you made about how much this is a domino effect. I don't know. I don't think people realize if you agree with me how 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 much you know something goes wrong and people and, and students don't go to class. You know, education comes to a stall, and that is affecting not only the students but you know generations basically if this goes on. So that's I think that's that's one thing that comes out of this. And we're already getting a couple of questions that are actually I can group a few of them. And I want to just to, to, to tell you now, and maybe we can talk more when we have the question uh, session, uh, Dr. Patrinos, which have to do with the morale of the teachers. You know, I, I think it's a great thing to, you know, what what is this? I mean, I'm an educator myself, so I'm just thinking, you know, wow, this is going to affect. It's not only affecting the students, yes, which which are of course priority for all educators, but also the educators themselves, the content, the morale, the change in the toolkit, as as one person has actually uh, correctly noted. So I, I think it's it's interesting. So let me just go to the next speaker. I just missed the sounder for a moment. Apologies. And uh, we will have time to talk about these. I wanted to invite uh, uh, Nicholas Piachot to, to speak to us. Nicholas is the head of advocacy and analysis at the Varki Foundation. And I think uh, Varki, the name Varki is very well known to, to all of us uh, for, for, for the work the Varki Foundation has done. Hi, thank you so much, and I hope you can see the presentation. Yep. Yes, yes. Fant fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone. I, I hope you're keeping safe and well, uh, and I'm really delighted to be talking to you. And thank you so much, Harry, for laying so much of the groundwork for what I'm going to say now. Um, let's start by saying today there are more children enrolled in school than at any point in human history. Uh, or at least before COVID there were. The last 25 years have seen unprecedented numbers of children enrolled in school. And that means that tens of millions of kids are getting the chance to have an education that their parents just never had. But we've also seen a deep and growing gulf in access to and quality of education. Uh, one manifested between rich and poor, between boys and girls, and yes, between black children and white children. And this inequality at least in how I see it and how the Barkey Foundation sees it, this is a greater threat than COVID-19. This inequality in education, inequity in access and quality of education is striking at the heart of education worldwide. It threatens progress on the UN Sustainable Development Framework. It puts uh, the UN's global goal on education further and further out of reach. Uh, this is nowhere better manifested than in how countries have been able to respond to COVID-19. Uh, we've seen that, as, as Harry has said, the, the very richest uh, countries have been able to deliver relatively high quality packages of online learning, which although they can't fully mitigate the damage to learning done by the COVID pandemic, they've 
at least offered some kind of bridge while schools have been shut down. But the poorest countries have had to rely on traditional mass media, which just isn't good enough. Um, today, let's look at inequality in education. Let's look at what causes it, how it manifests, and let's look at what can be usefully done in the cabinet office and in the classroom to address it. And let's just start by saying this is an incredibly difficult knot to untangle. Inequality is really difficult to do in a tight 15 minutes, but let me do my best here. Um, for me, when I think about inequality, and there must be thousands of papers done describing it, the most useful way that I think about it is to think of it as a series of interlinked factors that conspire and collaborate to exclude children and young people from education income, disability, gender, ethnicity, location. All of these are key factors that stop children from getting the education that they deserve. Um, for example, in at least 20 countries around the world, no poor rural young women complete secondary school. Now that's something that isn't just one thing. It's not just one factor, it's gender, it's location and uh, it's, it's income. So these are fundamentally interlinked factors that go far beyond education systems and they reach out across countries and societies. And to defeat them, it takes a whole government approach. It requires the Ministry of Finance as well as the Ministry of Education. Let's start with probably the biggest factor, income. Is there a price point for a good education? Who gets to go to a good school? We know that socioeconomic status is a major predictor of learning achievement around the world. Uh, as this figure makes clear in the poorest countries in countries like Zambia and Guatemala and Paraguay and Cambodia, uh, the poorer you are, you are significantly less likely uh, to have a good learning outcome in reading and mathematics. But in, in richer countries and more high performing countries, uh, the effects of disadvantage and socioeconomic disadvantage is relatively mitigated. We also know that income affects who completes school. So we know that the, the richer you are, the better you do at education, but it also means that you're more likely to spend more time in school. If we can think of the last 25 years of being a success story and getting more kids in school, that doesn't mean that the kids are staying in school. In fact, we can see that in some of the poorest countries in the world, in sub-Saharan Africa, relatively few kids are able, relatively few students, children and young people, uh, finish primary school or lower secondary school. Income also affects the world's most disadvantaged children, out of school children. A disproportionate share of the world's out of school children are from poor countries and households. Now by that, I don't mean the, the one and a half billion kids cut off from the classroom by COVID-19. I'm talking about the kids who may never set foot in a classroom or who have been cut off from the classroom by conflict and displacement and economic crisis. Pupils tend to do better if their family is a wealthier. That's something that we've seen time and time again in international standardized testing in the PISA tests. It's something that the OECD frequently return to when breaking down the analysis between the countries. We also know that the learning gap between rich and poor starts early. It manifests in kids as young as 10, and it only widens throughout students' lives. In other words, to defeat income inequality in education, we have to start very early indeed. But there are also interesting takeaways. If you're a disadvantaged student, if you're a student from a poor background who goes to an advantaged school, you will on average score 78 points higher than you would if you went to a disadvantaged school. That's equivalent to more than two and a half years of schooling. So your location does make a difference. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will know Andreas Schleicher of the OECD, and he's frequently said that a student's postal code is still the best predictor for the quality of the education that students acquire. And that's a fundamental takeaway from everything that I'm going to say to you today, that it depends on where you are and it depends on who you are. But poor students do beat the odds, and that's something of use to know to teachers and to policymakers. The OECD has talked about this in terms of what they call resilience, but it's the idea that about one in 10 disadvantaged pupils will actually score 
in the top quarter of science performance in their countries. And actually a quarter of disadvantaged pupils will score at PISA level three or above in science reading and maths. The point is that there is a wealth, an enormous wealth of untapped ability that it forced to education systems to unlock. And this is something that can be done because there are enough outliers to prove that it should be done. But this is a nut that policymakers still need to crank. When we think of inequity and inequality in education, the world we have to talk about race, about ethnicity. We know that poverty, that systemic racism or the legacy of systemic racism can block access to a good education. And that's something evident, of course, in the poorest countries, in may I say the most authoritarian countries, but also even in the richest countries in the world. No country is immune to the effects of ethnicity. Being a member of an ethnic minority or an indigenous minority can dramatically reduce your access to a quality education. In fact, racism and poverty can effectively shut the door on quality learning. That can manifest through systemic racism, through discriminatory laws and policies that, lack, that, that limit the access to, to education. It of course includes socioeconomic disadvantage, the fact that minority groups or indigenous communities tend to live in, in poor areas and more remote locations. In the US, uh, the richest country in the world, um, public schools still remain highly segregated by race and class, and that's 50 years since, since desegregation. So this isn't, this isn't just what's happening today, it's the aftershocks of deep, deep racist inequality enacted uh, a half a century ago. And in fact, it's worth thinking of a, a recent major study into uh, segregation in US schools that found, again, a complex interplay between uh, the legacy of racism and uh, inequality and poverty. It concluded that segregation concentrates minority students in high poverty schools, which are on average less effective. So again and again, we come back to the idea that poverty and income affect access to education across the board but being from a racial minority is a particular disadvantage. This is a fundamental concern for policymakers because it is, as we shall see, something that they can do something meaningfully about. Governments should work to be levelling the playing fields. It is not enough to leave it, say, to the free market or to social effects. This is something that policymakers around the world should be working to address. We also have to think about gender. Now, there have been extraordinary success stories for women and, and girls over the last 25 years, but they still face the very worst forms of exclusion. There are more girls and young women in schools than ever before. Since 1995, the number of girls enrolled in schools around the world has risen, risen by about 180 million. The world is also moving towards gender parity in education. Um, in 2018, I think, there was one girl enrolled in school for every boy. And over the past quarter century, girls have closed a 4% uh, percentage uh, gap in uh, enrollment ratios. We also know that girls' learning is catching up or in many cases exceeding boys. Girls tend to do better than boys in most countries in reading. They are on par in most countries or exceeding them in mathematics as well. But girls are still subject to the worst forms of exclusion. They are more likely to be out of school. And while more girls are in school, fewer girls complete it than boys. As we said before, in at least 20 countries, hardly any poor rural young women complete secondary school. But many of the world's young women are poor and they are rural. Inequality hits poorest women the hardest. In 59 countries, women from the poorest households are four times more likely to be illiterate than those from the richest households. The question is, what can governments meaningfully do about this? One of the most useful frameworks I've seen recently has been from the Center for Global Development, and they propose something called the Girls' Education Policy Index. Now, I think this is absolutely fascinating and everyone should look at it. It looks at the five key levers that policymakers can pull to improve things for girls and young women in education systems. Now, it looks like from, from the obvious things like the financial barriers, things like incentives for girls to attend school, things like um, banning child marriage and enabling pregnant uh, teenagers and young women to return to school. But it also looks at social effects. Who are the role models for, for girls in school? What percentage of your teacher workforce is female? 
what percentage of your law, your legislature is uh, made up of women. And I think that's a really important thing because it speaks to the idea that inequality is not just something that happens in education. There's a social effect that is witnessed across the whole spectrum of, of everyday life. If you're poor and you're a woman, you're not just behind in education, you also have an extraordinary number of other barriers and challenges to overcome. I wanted to finish by talking about what teachers can do. Every systemic challenge in education, we tend to think about it in terms of what policymakers can do. We too often forget that the only solution to it are teachers working in classrooms around the world. Um, you can't solve an issue in education without teachers. And as our founder, Mr. Sonny Varki, is so fond of saying, no education system can outpace the quality of its teachers. My foundation is very proud to work with hundreds of incredible teachers around the world. And I wanted to talk about very briefly about what they are doing to defeat inequality. Um, in the Canadian Arctic, in these frozen reaches in a town so far off the map that you can only reach it by an aeroplane, uh, Maggie McDonnell, one of our Global Teacher Prize winners, is working with Indigenous school children who are affected by extraordinary levels of poverty and disadvantage, whose learning outcomes are very poor. She is working with them to reconnect them with their Indigenous culture and by teaching them life skills. Her thesis is that learning is built upon not just a foundation of reading and writing, which is of course incredibly important, but of good mental health and of a connection to a culture and a continuance of care and, and self-confidence that goes beyond education. What Maggie is doing is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, in an environment that couldn't be more different in the city of London, uh, where I'm speaking to you from now, we have Andrea Zafiraku. She works in a school uh, where the kids speak over 130 languages. It is an extraordinarily diverse but very poor uh, place. Uh, many of the kids can't afford uniforms. They rely on free school meals. Andrea is working to reconnect them and to, to bolster inequality by fostering creativity, by encouraging them to paint and to dance and to sing, and by expanding their horizons. In the West Bank, we have Hanan El Haroub, who is working with refugee school children affected by the continuation of the armed conflict there. Now, there are few children more vulnerable to inequality and exclusion than, than refugees and those affected by conflict. Hanan's approach, her pedagogy is built around peace building, uh, around building uh, a shared sense of community and by building and promoting peace. And finally, in, in, in Kenya, we have Peter Tabichi, who works with school children from desperately poor communities. His school has only one working computer. It doesn't have any internet. Uh, Peter loves to tell me how he shows his kids videos on his phone because that's the only way he can get access to internet there. His children have gone on to compete and win in international science competitions. They've gone to the US and won science competitions there. What they have done is extraordinary and I think it goes to show, to link back to what I was saying before, this idea of resilience, that actually kids around the world are just as smart as each other and the issues that cause inequity are systemic. They're caused by poverty and, uh, and location. And these are something that policymakers can work very usefully to address. Um, thank you very much. And uh, if you do have any questions, I look forward to hearing from them at the end. Thank you very, very much, Nicholas. Uh, amazing presentation. We're getting amazing, uh, amazing comments. And uh, I kept a few things that I would like to to share. One of them being, of course, the the Girls Education Policy Index, which, of course, that's that is amazingly interesting. And I I, I will do some research on my own on that one. Uh, the focus that the Varki Foundation is giving to teachers, I think that is that is kind of the uh, the, our, another way of seeing the problem, because if if we as educators, you know, make the change on our own uh, or from starting from the teacher, I think that would be uh, probably a bit easier to make, you know, to, to solve the issue of inequality. So we all have to kind of like help in uh, this this whole problem. And I, I know the foundation is doing a lot of work in that. Very inspiring stories from from some of the places around the world. 
So keep up the amazing work. You will have the chance to to have a look at the questions in the system. So I'm sure you can you can you can comment on, on that as well. So and and we will get back with Q and A. So excellent, amazing stuff. Uh, thank you, Harry initially and Nicholas. And I want to move to the third presentation. Uh, we are very honored to have Alexa Joyce with us who is the European, Middle East and African Education and Skills Director for Microsoft. I think everyone uh, understands, you know, the, the, the amount of responsibility and accountability that role has. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, you do a lot of work in the public sector, so it'll be great to, to also listen to your presentation. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all today, virtually to discuss this super important and exciting issue that we're all tackling in education right now. And I think we've heard from all of the speakers who've been setting context um, how challenging the current situation is and just how difficult it's been for students in terms of adjusting their learning approaches, adjusting their methods in terms of how they interact with teachers, how they interact with their parents who've become proxy teachers in many cases. And right now in the middle of a second wave that we're experiencing here in, in Europe, my own children are not in school right now. Many students are still at home or are in um, hybrid learning scenarios where we see this mix of digital, mix of face-to-face -face in some cases in limited classes, and also a huge variety in terms of what hybrid learning actually means. We see here in Europe in places like Finland where the usage of technology is deeply integrated into education in many ways and access to technology is not an issue and they've been doing a lot of live lessons. Um, meanwhile, in other countries, and just like here in Belgium where I live, Technology is still new for some teachers, particularly at primary level. And so it's been very much an asynchronous model with students using traditional books and simply receiving assignments from teachers by email, a couple, maybe once or twice a week or every day, but with no direct face-to-face -face contact in a uh, video or virtual experience for them. So what we mean by hybrid learning is, is extremely diverse. And what I would say from the Microsoft side, um, we've really seen that in terms of the usage of technology in learning, that there has been more change since the beginning of the COVID pandemic in terms of technology adoption in the classroom than there has been in the last 10 years. And this has put immense pressure on teachers in terms of evolving their pedagogy immense pressure on school leaders in those systems where uh, they have had to take individual technology decisions. I think in those centralized systems where there has been kind of air cover offered by ministries of education who've helped to make that selection for schools and enabled schools to focus on evolving the pedagogy, it has been somewhat easier and some of the OECD research has, has borne that out. But we're still very much in a phase of, of learning, of experimentation, of improvement, of iterative approaches to how we actually do digital pedagogy in the world of hybrid learning. And we have to keep doing this. We have to keep moving and examining and reflecting on the approaches and the practices that we're implementing to make sure that they're really effective. So what we've seen when we work together with countries across the world there are several key elements to the way that we think about digital inclusion in the post COVID world. And the first is really actually having a strong hybrid and online learning strategy. Um, we've seen some countries putting teachers really at the center of the process in terms of thinking about what does that digital pedagogy look like? How do they build it out? How do they create different types of learning scenarios despite being in an online world? and also a huge focus on the availability of devices. I think those countries that had strong social policy in place that had connectivity and devices in the hands of, of families who were maybe socially excluded found it easier to move towards hybrid learning than those countries that didn't. And we're seeing a huge scramble worldwide with the purchasing of devices reaching levels never seen before in education because school systems everywhere are trying to make sure that students who don't have those devices available in the home actually have access to them. And at the same time, um, making sure that there is uh, connectivity available for students. I think it's come as a big surprise, even for the most developed countries, just how poor connectivity is um, in terms of facilitating remote learning. So 
We've even heard about stories in the UK where parents were making the choice between buying additional data packages on their mobile phone or buying food for the household so that the, their children could carry on connecting with their learning. And then working in countries like Senegal, which I'll talk about later, obviously there's huge parts of the countries which just have no provision at all, whether it's through data or um, and telecom um, networks or through satellite connections. And so many governments are trying to really accelerate quickly those connectivity projects to make sure that we, we reach those really um, disadvantaged communities that are not able to connect. But to enable all of this to actually work, we need to make sure that we're leveraging our investments effectively, that we're choosing technologies that are laying the foundation for a sustainable future in terms of the usage of technology in schools and having really good skilling and remote professional development strategies in place so that we can support educators in getting the skills that they need so that they can support their students and at the same time not neglecting parents skills in that mix because parents have become one of the gatekeepers of learning it particularly in a homeschooling scenarios. We have got a huge opportunity, though, that's been generated by the usage of more digital platforms in education. That is, we've got more data on the process of learning than we've ever had before. And this enables us to start to do some really interesting research on what type of behaviours result in learning gains. Um, through platforms like Teams, we can correlate how students are learning in terms of their activity and engagement with each other or with learning content versus the type of grades that they're getting in learning assignments. But all of this has to be underpinned by a really strong security and privacy strategy to ensure that we're actually making ethical and responsible use of all of this data that um, we're generating and ethical and responsible use of the tools that we have. So this digital transformation is implying new ways of learning, new ways of teaching and new ways of working as education systems. And we're seeing dramatic change in the way that systems think about how they integrate technology. We had an emergency pedagogy phase in March where pretty much all systems were just kind of throwing different approaches out there to see what would work. And then as the new back to school phase came here in Northern Europe, we saw new types of approaches evolving where um, schools had taken the school holidays as an opportunity to refine and improve their approaches. And it's become very much a conversation that now goes beyond the classroom. We're not thinking about what just happens in, in the classroom from a technology standpoint, but how can we infra in, <laughs> optimize the infrastructure more broadly whether it's the connectivity, whether it's the device provision, and make sure that learning is really possible beyond, beyond the classroom. And I think there's also been a dramatic change in the way that people understand what types of devices are effective for learning and what learning scenarios different devices are appropriate for. We've seen in the past um, many examples of school systems trying to pick essentially the cheapest possible device with the idea that if you go for something very low cost, you can give out a large number of them and lots of students benefit. But we've seen that that goes um, can go really tragically wrong with, for instance, in cases like in South Africa, where we saw low cost devices um, within one year, 50 percent of the devices purchased actually no longer working or being stolen because they didn't have appropriate security tools embedded in them. And so what I'm excited to see is that more and more um, ministries of education and schools are thinking thoughtfully about which device do I choose based on the developmental cap capabilities of my students? I want to pick something which is higher quality, which is resistant, that's going to be a more sustainable choice for my system and for my school so that I can use it today with this year group, but I can also use it with other students in future. And the same applies for the types of tools and technologies that we embed into the learning process. We've seen a lot of enterprise tools simply being moved into education and expecting them to work well in education scenarios. And unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily always bear out, particularly if we're thinking about primary or secondary students who need to have rich approaches that involve a lot of graphical, um, fun ways to interact with content which are more uh, close to entertainment, the gamified learning approaches. And then as students grow to get them closer to productivity tools that they're going to experience in the workplace so that they're really prepared to use professional level productivity tools once they go into their job or they go into higher education. And 
in higher education scenarios, we're seeing a lot of really interesting adoption being made of tools which are professional level develop, development tools, professional level IT tools that enable students to go out and to be the real builders and constructors of the technology solutions of tomorrow instead of being technology consumers. One of the things that we've focused on a great deal is how we can work together with the public sector as we've implemented um, remote and hybrid learning with our customers across the world and UNESCO has been a key part of this. Um, we were a founding member of the Global Coalition for a COVID Response together with UNESCO and so we've been working with ministries of education particularly in low and middle income countries to make sure that they have off access to Office 365 as a free teaching and learning platform in perpetuity, that we offer dedicated training programs that have been built and tested for connectivity with low data access and with low end device con um, uh, availability. So we've been testing out using teams in offline scenarios, using teams in scenarios where you can only connect, say maybe once a day or once a week so that we can synchronize and plan asynchronous learning scenarios and building out rapid fire training that can be easily given to large numbers of teachers in a short period of time. And we've seen amazing impact of this approach um, across the world and we built it by being thoughtful, by being based on research and created scenarios for teaching and learning that were based on the different levels of access to devices and curriculum and digital content. And based on these scenarios, um, we then developed what could be the pedagogical scenarios that the technology availability could enable and use these to then build our professional development materials and our recommendations um, that we gave to governments as they thought about their remote and hybrid learning process. All of this is underpinned by the long term research that we've been doing in education through um, the Education Transformation Framework, which is a roadmap and planning tool we've been offering to governments to help them think about how they transform the education system in their countries. And this roadmap is something that they can use both for today's remote and hybrid learning scenario needs, but also for thinking more long term about where they want to get to in the future and envision what the new normal um, without being bogged down by this kind of emergency pedagogy needs um, could really look like. So as I mentioned, we've been working closely with Senegal. We saw dramatic growth in the usage of technology in Senegal, thanks to this partnership together with UNESCO and ourselves, as well as other partners in the global coalition. And what's been really interesting is since we implemented this, we've seen the growth in the usage of Teams as a teaching and learning platform in Senegal coming up to the same kind of level as much more developed economies within their geography. So even in a, a location like Senegal where access is a challenge, where um, students are sharing one device in a home, they might be having just one smartphone among multiple si siblings and a parent. Even there, we've seen that it's possible to use technology for a remote and hybrid learning strategy and see significant adoption within a country. I think one of the other key learnings that we've really taken away from the remote learning um, experiences has been how lonely it can be for students. Uh, one of our speakers mentioned earlier about the level of um, students um, failing to complete their education or dropping out of schooling. And much of this is because of the sense of isolation which comes in a remote or hybrid learning scenario. And so this is something that we really concentrated on from our education research and education engineering perspective was to look at what kinds of interfaces enable a more rich and social learning experience. And so we built a new interface for teams. This is the teams together mode where you can envision the people that you're working and learning with in actually a traditional lecture hall um, space. And it can look kind of gimmicky, but what's really fascinating about the research that's been done is that the cognitive load of interacting with others within this type of space is significantly lower than in the typical everyone in the small Hollywood boxes, as they call it, um, kind of visualization that we have in many um, digital platforms. And as soon as you start to switch to this mode, you notice that um, the interaction between people in the space becomes much more natural, much more fluid, much more informal. People try to actually reach out and touch each other virtually. And so I think there's some really rich opportunities for us collectively to experiment with what kinds of affordances do technologies and technology interface choices give us in terms of the learning impacts that we can generate among students um, experiencing these types of platforms in their um, everyday learning lives. 
So we want to think about ways to make technology more sticky, to make it more rich, to make it more engaging for students. And we found that there's a lot of key issues that we have to build into the pedagogy to make the most of this type of learning. So switching between synchronous and asynchronous to break up the routine, to focus on having an agile and flexible mindset as much for teachers as for school leaders as for students. Um, thinking about having that strong skills strategy, leveraging the potential to bring in new voices from further outside of the community, because after all, we don't have to worry anymore if somebody can come to visit the classroom. We can connect with a scientist or a researcher in a research station um, in the North Pole if we want to. And fundamentally, to also not forget, we are in the middle of an emergency. Students, parents, teachers were all going through really difficult personal circumstances and we need to be much more human and much more empath um, empathetic in um, teaching and learning in the digital world during the COVID crisis. All of this is challenging for teachers, um, so we haven't neglected teachers in making this happen. Um, at Microsoft, we have um, invested a lot in teacher training to enable them to um, deploy effective remote and hybrid learning through creating uh, self-training programs that, that teachers can access anytime they need and want. And also by using our network of 400 global training partners, which Sophia is one of them, um, to ensure that training is out there in multiple languages for every single teacher who would need it when they need it to make um, remote and hybrid learning a really rich experience. So I think we've seen um, during the COVID period a really unprecedented willingness of public and private sector to come together to learn lessons quickly, to experiment quickly and to try to understand what's going to be really the most effective way to ensure that learning doesn't stop despite the COVID pandemic. And we want that to continue so that we can really build back to a new normal a new education system that is richer, more rewarding and more inspiring for every single student. Thank you. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. Uh, so very, very comprehensive, I must say. And uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, many of you will be able to to uh, to have a look and review these presentations when we complete. And if you, of course, shared your email, we'll be happy to to send them and give you access to that. Uh, we have a couple of more things to do until we until we finish. Uh, I just want to say one point about the fact that Microsoft has been doing an amazing job in trying to not only see it from a technology point of view. I think that's what uh, Alexa Joyce was 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 telling us. I mean, one of the amazing things is that you know you have, for example, the trainer, the the, the educator from one side and the, and the technology company from the other, and and we need to listen to each other because it's in the old days it was only technology or only the educator, and I think that is becoming better. It's becoming more, uh, I think, open, and I think it's becoming more accessible. Many, many of the questions that have been coming in have been answered, by the way, and the team uh, is making an effort to answer, to share it in the, in the chat box, so you, you'll see a lot of your answers being answered uh, there. We'll talk more. We have two more things to do, questions and answers, and uh, let me sh uh, uh, invite, of course, Mr. Stelios Christakos, uh, who is also a good friend. Stelio, great to have you on, on, on this roundtable. And Stelios is the Chief Executive Officer of Sophia Education Experts, working very closely with Microsoft, so I'll be happy to hear what he has to say. Stelio. Yes, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from uh, whatever the time zone you are logging in. I'm seeing people posting from early in the morning to late in the evening. So it's uh, for us, it's very important to have people from all over the globe. And uh, after these amazing presentations, uh, I'll have to present you a, a little different point of view. Let's say summing up uh, all the solutions that uh, we have found. Access to education, which is a fundamental human right, is always threatened and compromised in times of crisis like this. Economic crisis, wars, environmental crisis and pandemics always impact on the education of children and this affects us all for many years in the future. And this is something that uh, also Mr. Patrinos elaborated before. During uh, COVID-19, schools shut their doors but opened a new door the door of unprecedented transformation in education. However, it is not going to be a successful transformation unless the global teaching community makes sure that all the students remain on the right side of this new door. 
The information presented here is from our own experience as we work with more than 100 schools in many different countries and we have worked with ministries and other stakeholders in education and also from organizations like UNESCO, UNICEF, World Bank, OECD, Microsoft, the Varki Foundation, the World Economic Forum for a Business Perspective, etc. So our experience from the field is summarized in the following slides. This is something that uh, already discussed uh, uh, during the previous presentations, but I'd like to sum them up from what we see. So it is true that the income plays an important role also for the at-risk students and also the students for, that are coming from uh, low-income families. Uh, students that have lower educated parents, students who are first language is not the language of teaching or they have disabilities or learning difficulties. And uh, for some countries, being a female student is uh, really a problem. So these are the profiles that we have to address. And uh, this is how governments all over the world have uh, uh, tried to address this important issue. From the data published by UNICEF, UNESCO and World Bank and collected through surveys carried out on the local offices, it becomes evident that the majority of the countries apply the remote learning policies to ensure that learning is maintained during the COVID-19 crisis and that uh, the students from primary to upper secondary are rich. You can see the mediums, internet, radio, television and the total and most of the countries have uh, such measures. Uh, what we can see is that uh, in the same report, it becomes apparent that in some parts of the world, students can't be reached via the internet. For many students in South Asia, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, radio and TV are the only channels to communicate and continue learning. And we understand that the quality of education is not so good through these mediums. Now, all over the world, the governments have taken immediate measures to support the most disadvantaged families. Some examples of these uh, measures are from Spain, a recently adopted law rules that families with children that were entitled to school meals, they will be getting financial aid or food for the period that the schools remain closed. The Dutch government devoted a budget of 2.5 million euros for the purchase of laptops for students who didn't have a device giving them this way immediate access to remote learning. In Portugal, a national TV channel was broadcasting classes in several subjects. This way they managed to reach this household that didn't have access to the internet or a device. In Ireland, the Department for Education and Skills gave teachers and educational institutions specific advice and resources to support students threatened by educational disadvantage. Now, a number of the problems that arose are listed here. I have two slides for this, and this is the way that uh, it was addressed by various uh, countries and governments. So for the loss of instructional time, uh, what they did was provide online learning, of course, but also having the TV and radio educational broadcasts. And some countries uh, introduced the educational packages that they sent over to students. For the problem of the teachers being unprepared to handle the change because it happened so ra rapidly, the solutions were distant learning for professional development, readjustment of the curriculum and assessment calendar, and this is something very important because we cannot have the same type of education in real time and uh, online, and the governments created hotlines for technical support to support uh, both parents and teachers. For the lack of connectivity and equipment, of course, the usage of TV and the radio was one, and the governments lent uh, teachers and students devices, and in some cases, uh, they did a partnership with post offices in order to be able to deliver educational materials. Now, for the problem that the students lack the right space for online lessons, there are not so many solutions, unfortunately, but uh, it is uh, something that can be addressed with from the teachers, from the educators, if they are able to communicate flexibly with the students. For the problem of the students uh, deprived of the school meals, which is very important. We have families receiving either a refund for the school fees or provision of meals on a pick up and go basis 
or issuing redeemable credit cards for any commercial food establishment. So people could go out and uh, get the food from there. Now for the big problem of the increase in the dropouts, sorry. Some schools remained open for the at-risk children and social pedagogues provided advice to students as much as possibly by phone. For the burden that uh, is becoming on parents, we, we talked a little bit, it's very important. Online pedagogical support for the parents, teaching guidelines and learning materials for the parents, and a few schools remained open for the children that could not be taken care of at home. Now, the methodologies that amplify student engagement. I have listed a few here that I think are very important, uh, starting with uh, social emotional learning. Now, more than ever, we understand how important it is to demonstrate empathy and resilience, build relationships across distance. All these skills are extremely important to students who belong at the at-risk groups, as it is a fact that people with strong social emotional skills are better able to cope with everyday challenges and benefit academically, professionally and socially. Project-based learning, you know about that. It allows students to explore and have their own pace and explore their curiosity and uh, with their teammates, etc. Assessment strategies. There are gaps and disparities in educational services, especially at some, as some schools remain closed fully or partially. And we live that in many countries around the world now. So this is a different way to address this is to change the timing and the strategies that assessments are being used. Now, schools are being advised by assessment professionals to use formative or informal, ongoing and flexible testing in order to help and identify the students' academic strengths and weaknesses and to collect other accountability data, such as attendance, in order to measure overall student well-being. Now, regarding the curriculum, a lot of discussion on the what, how, where, by whom, and when of education. So this discussion now has changed a lot because of the means that we deliver the education. And uh, these are all important questions that have to be addressed. The student-centered teaching, lessons built on students' curiosity, it's very important. Now we have a plethora of online apps and tools, free, free that sparkled students' curiosity and engagement. And uh, so educators can use them in order to increase the, the, the curiosity of the children. Now, the blend and learning is to help those who lack access to devices and connectivity. We discussed a lot about it from, uh, we heard a lot about it from the previous speakers, but I will also come back with some uh, solutions. Now, in the next two slides, I have some uh, key problems and some workable solutions. Students, teachers and students used to be uh, offering the traditional way of learning, and uh, they are resistant to adjust to the demands of their online learning because it is not so easy for most people. Teachers and students in lower income countries are even more resistant as they have to face a number of practical problems as well. The solution is the change of mindset and actively see collaboration and guidance. School administrators need to provide teachers with context regarding each student's circumstances. This way teachers will manage to connect with their students with other means and come up with ways to reach them in the most effective way. We talked a little bit before about social and emotional learning, but they need to know from the beginning and act proactively. Children in poorer areas of the planet have received the minimum of distant learning. We saw the example with the TV and radio only, the, the possible means for education. They were just passive receivers of piece of knowledge, and this affects their levels of motivation. The remote lessons need to be interactive and spark their imagination and creativity. This is extremely important for the overall effort to minimize dropouts due to remote learning inefficiency. Teachers of underprivileged students need to innovate and produce time flexion solutions, time flexible solutions, in order to provide their students with lessons that are as interactive as possible. We all know that the relationship a student builds with his teachers can really shape their future. 
According to a research by Shim Ho Kim from Department of Health Policy and Management at Korea University, improving students' relationships with teachers could have important, positive and long-lasting effects beyond just academic success. It is crucial that students continue forming strong relationships with their teachers in remote learning as well, which is not something easy. Underprivileged students will lose significantly the positive effects of this kind of relationship. So governments and educational institutions need to provide teachers with a variety of alternative ways to maintain a stable communication with the student. The hybrid model, of course, can help a lot here. We already saw a few solutions for the problem with the meals and the governments need to be flexible addressing this very important issue. Now, school closures are expected to exacerbate girls and women's unpaid care work, thus limiting the time to learn at home. The absence of schools as safe places heightens the risk of various gender-based violence for the girls around uh, the world. The educational community needs to collect data and share it with school and country authorities in an effort to protect these girls. Now we talked a little bit about the e-learning platform, but I would like to say a few things because it's uh, the way that uh, teaching is being delivered uh, from the platform is really, really important because this is the tool that uh, gives the ability to the teacher to do the best of his work. Now, synchronous, and synchronous learning is a key for situations like the present. Some platforms have been offering the chance of synchronous and asynchronous learning. This can benefit students who have restricted access to a computer or they do not have a quiet environment at home. For example, some teachers have given the students the chance to see recording of their lessons and access files anytime. Tools for assessment. We need a variety of assessment tools to keep students' attention at high level we discussed a little bit before about. Collaboration between teachers is key to improve performance and solve pressing problems, exchanging views between them. Inclusivity refers to be able to provide access to students with any type of learning difficulty and also those whose first language is not the language of teaching. This can be captions like we saw before with Alexa uh, presenting, can be translators, can be immersive readers, etc. Now, regarding the following three bullets, teachers use a variety of tools to create questionnaires and polls in order to identify its students' needs. This creates an invaluable pool of data that can help institutions to identify inequalities and help each student individually, as they have a very clear idea of their backgrounds and how they can intervene to help. Sparking creativity, students' innate creativity found new channels to be expressed. Underprivileged students, unfortunately, at times cannot take advantage of all the capacities of platforms. They get the minimum that platforms can give them for a number of reasons we explained before. So it is very important to improve access to platforms and we'll see later in our proposals. Teach essential skills for students' future. In an effort to make the inequality gap smaller for the future of our students, we need to teach them essential digital literacy skills that will help them to be successful. E-learning platforms teach intentionally and unintentionally these types of skills. And of course, providing a safe learning environment, it is very important for education and students that they must feel cyber and emotional safety when they use the platform, regarding their identity, their private uh, data and anonymous code. I want to close my presentation with some ideas of call to action for the stakeholders involved in education. So I'm starting from the policy makers and the ministries. Uh, I think that it's important to invest in infrastructure so as many students as possible have the means to, to be included in this hybrid learning. Also invest in professional development for teachers and administrative staff form partnerships to enhance connectivity and uh, be able to provide at least one device per classroom, at least, so that there is a place where children who do not have access to the, the connect or connectivity to the internet can go there and can learn in the classroom. And of course, continue with the radio and TV lessons. Now, the next uh, level is prefectures and districts, which they have the maintenance of the school buildings. They have to ensure connectivity for the schools. 
and they have to protect the at-risk uh, communities with the ways that we saw before. Next, for the schools to install and have and maintain the hybrid learning at its best level, to invest in flexible classrooms so if there is a hybrid learning scenario, they can uh, uh, adjust the, the uh, size of the classroom and identify at-risk students in order to support them. Now, regarding educators, they have to become familiar with the platforms. It's not an easy task. We have seen that the past few months, but it's something achievable, at least to a center level, very quickly. Collaborate with other educators in order to exchange views and ideas. Adopt the social and emotional learning for the students. Be adaptive and a change of mindset. I know it's too much to ask, but this is something maybe a new model of the educator with a hybrid uh, uh, way of addressing the students. And uh, also for parents, they have to seek support in order to be able to provide help to their students, to their children, adapt their expectations because the delivery of the lessons will not be the same in the hybrid model as in the classroom, and familiarize with the new teaching models, which is the new norm. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Stelio, for your presentation and uh, a couple of good points on the solutions there. The amazing thing to say before we go for a few minutes on Q&A and then listen to the, the founder of Sophia at the end, uh, and I will try to summarize with uh, Mr. Dukas at some point for all of you, and uh, I think all of you are waiting for that. So I think you, the, 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 the fact that you talked about a different mindset, the solution does also require a different mindset. It's not something you can just change like that. That's, that's a, a very good point. And what you said about changing the way you do the education, it's not because you're doing it online, you have to simulate face to face. And people are, are, are in many governments have not realized that. So uh, thank you very, very much. I have, we have time for two or three very quick questions and I will ask the speakers to support me on this, uh, maybe just two or three, maybe uh, at least for the first speakers who spoke, because we can we can take that on with Stelios and Mr. Dukas at the end. Now, uh, I've grouped a few of them, so I just very openly and maybe in one or two minutes, please, as an answer, just one or two minutes. And I know a lot of the stuff may you know need elaboration, but you know uh, just just for time reasons, I would like like to start with uh, with uh, Harry. Uh, in the beginning, and uh, Harry spoke a lot about the cost of this problem with COVID. COVID has accelerated uh, a number of changes, and uh, we saw that it's a domino effect. So we know there's a big issue with what's going on, and we haven't seen the, you know, the consequences yet. But please, I would like your view on the cost of, ha has the World Bank made any estimation, if possible? There are some questions on this on the cost of changing to technology, the infrastructure of schools. Do you think that's going to happen? Is that something that, that is the next step? Uh, and, and is there any you know, financial estimation on this? Thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, we don't have a global number, but I wanted to share a few things. One is um, our dialogue pre-COVID in, in Europe and Central Asia was about education reform, higher education. It has since changed to the fundamentals of education, the online system during the emergency, the building of a, of a technological response for future um, pandemics and also for strengthening the, uh, the education system. But we're also seeing a, a, a renewed interest in uh, school infrastructure, safety of schools primarily. There are still schools in Europe and Central Asia that don't have sanitary facilities. 21st century Europe, and we still have schools that are not prepared. So it's very difficult to, to say, look at the example of Norway and Germany. They opened successfully, but they have the safety and um, sanitary uh, um, uh, minimum requirements. But also, what kind of learning environment? There's, there was already uh, discussions about the learning environment, how it contributes to, to, uh, to learning. Uh, this has become even more pronounced. That is probably the number one request that we're getting now is what do we do about the learning environment? Uh, I think in terms of the, the costs of responding, at the very least, we need to maintain the education spending. There'll be a lot of pressure in countries to reduce expenditures. What I've noticed in the last few months is that the high performing education systems have actually uh, announced increases to their education spending, whereas some of the middle income countries are struggling 
uh, to even maintain the education budget. It's it's imperative that um, fundamental spending remains and then targeted interventions to improve the learning environment, the technological response, and of course, the, the learning recovery, but in a way that will uh, fundamentally change and reform systems so they become resilient and able to absorb some of these uh, future shocks, but also build the kind of uh, education, educated citizenry countries want. I think I think one one of the reasons, as you know, uh, Harry, that we did this is to stress the issue of of this gap. And uh, yourself, Nicholas, and Joyce did stress that, uh, and Stelius provided some of the solutions. So you know, I think it was interesting to see that. And I I think you would all agree that it's a good opportunity. You know, every crisis has opportunities. I think now is the time for people to to stress that we you know we need the funding, and you know things need to be done. I think people are listening now. So let me go to the sec the the second question uh, to 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 Nicholas, if if possible. And uh, Nicholas, I've kind of grouped a few things, and there were a couple of issues or questions on uh, on on the teacher and and the the educator's morale you know and i know the foundation uh, you spoke very 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 you, know, uh, uh, you you gave a good presentation on what's going on in the inequality being there and your work of course stressing you know on the educator what would you do to increase is there anything going on around the world that you know can help did you believe in going from the educator uh from from that part to, to solve the problem of inequality. How important is that? You did mention that, and I think I think people want to listen a little bit more on that. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't solve systemic issues in education without teachers. They are the most fundamental component of any education system. And I think it's something that tends to get overlooked a little bit from time to time is that these are real people doing very, very hard jobs at the best of times that would exhaust us that we couldn't do. And they're now being asked to do it in the middle of a pandemic. Before the pandemic hit, I mean, if you look at the OECD's last available data, even in the richest countries, like over half of teachers said that they didn't feel prepared to use technology in their pedagogy. So, and that would be, uh, Nicholas, if I if I can just uh, stop yeah. you there, that would be a huge investment on its own, right? I mean, how yeah. to change that mindset and 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 the new toolkit, correct? Absolutely. So I think that they, they went in without the tools needed to, to teach in this pandemic. We have a network of world class teachers around the world. Their morale has been hit very, very hard by this pandemic. And I think one of the things that we've talked about uh, today is this sense of community that school and teachers have this sense of community that keeps everyone going through the worst. And that's been fractured and kids have been cut off from the classroom and teachers have been cut off from other teachers. What I will say to, to, to to speak to your point is that um, teachers around the world are doing extraordinary things for their students. And we've seen, as, as we saw in my presentation, teachers working in very remote areas or areas affected by conflict or you know areas where there's a huge amount of poverty. Um, it really speaks to strength of character and things that can't be easily measured, um, that they are the ones who are coming up with the solutions, despite the lack of technology, despite the lack of assistance from government. It's teachers being incredible teachers, which is going to get us through this, this pandemic. And it's teachers who are helping each other through this pandemic. And I think that's something that's important to stress as well, is that teachers are coming through from each other. I, I think one thing we also lose sight of is how much teachers are doing beyond the pedagogy. Actually, we, we've heard testimonies of teachers you know, delivering food to their students and of serving their communities and of being that vital link at the heart of communities that connects so many different strands, you know, business and parents and politicians, yeah. all, all of them at that nexus at the heart of the school, there's a teacher. So I think all of society really needs to do the best they can to support teachers. Now, I'm conscious I don't have much time, but what I'll say is this goes beyond policy. Governments are not very good at boosting morale. And maybe that's a good thing because if governments could change the way people feel about things, that would be a little worrying. This is an all of society thing. Now, in, in, in the UK and in many other countries, what we used to do was to go out and, and applaud our teachers, um, you know, every uh, so applaud our doctors every week and, and applaud paramedics and their contribution during the pandemic. It would be wonderful if our society could recognise the invaluable contribution that teachers have made during these very difficult months. And I think that's something that needs to come organically from society rather than from, from government. Very good points. Thank you, Nicholas, and very inspirational things for educators. So thank you very much on behalf of everyone. 
Uh, one more question to Joyce. And uh, you've been getting a lot of questions or, and comments from, from around the world because I guess Microsoft has been in the forefront and Teams has been, been used extensively. And, and, and I think it's a great tool uh, to help all of us as, as educators. Two things though, one is you talked a lot about, about, not a lot, but you did mention the analytics part, you're measuring things. And I think you know data is, is very important. How is that going to help the one-to-one, -one, the personalized education? Because there are a few questions and and I think you know data can help us because people learn differently, and they're you know in different settings you need different types of education, maybe uh, methodologies. So, is there any work being done? Uh, I, I know there is work, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure about the detail. And one crazy question for me: maybe Microsoft University soon. <laughs> So a um, couple of points around that. I think, first of all, Insights, um, it's in preview right now. You can get that already as an educator if you set up the preview. And Classroom Insights is a really powerful tool to understand what's going on with your students learning. So um, you can get insight like, you know, to what extent students have looked at different learning activities, how long they spent on them, um, completion rates across your class. So you can understand, you know, how easy or not it was to actually do a piece of homework or an activity that's been assigned. So that's kind of the functional pieces which help you to just see have students been able to progress through a learning activity and a set of, of processes that you've put in place as a teacher. But there's also a lot of insight in there that you can gain in terms of student habit and behavior. So for instance, um, you'll be able to see that um, some students are consistently working very early in the morning or some students are consistently working very late at night. And that can help you reach out to those students and say, hey, have you got something going on in the daytime that's preventing you from doing your schoolwork during the day? Is there something going on from a family perspective that you need some help with? And so I think one of the core parts of the way that we're building our insights tools is that um, we want to focus on how we can actually educate the educators and school leaders in using these tools in ways which are not punitive, but that they are tools not for command and control, but for better targeting to support the students who really need it according to what's going on in their lives. So I think that's that's one really key point. The other thing which is fascinating in some research that we did um, prior to the COVID pandemic was that we found by analyzing the behavior of students on, on Office 365 um, that we did in a school district in the US, those students who collaborated more with their peers were those students who had higher learning gains in the different subject areas in which that collaboration was taking place. So there are some kind of key factors which we can point to from the data that's generated, which show consistent learning gains for any type of student. And I think that type of insight is also really useful. Um, Microsoft University, um, great question. I think, uh, well, we already have Microsoft Learn, which is our platform for getting all kinds of technical training, which was an internal tool that we've made available to the whole world. So that's, that's out there already. I think um, we are, making more and more tools available for universities and for ministries of education to make available national learning platforms. Um, we've got national um, IT fitness platform in Germany, for instance, and I'm seeing more and more of these types of platforms being rolled up in partnership with governments around the world. So uh, maybe not called the Microsoft University per se, but watch this space. Thank you very, very much. Uh, amazing work. And I think data, of course, will give us a lot of answers going forward for one to one. So thank you very much. Let's go to the last part of today. And, and I think all of us are waiting for conclusions uh, and some proposals from uh, Mr. Dukas, who is the founder, of course, of School of the Future International Academy. And uh, I, I, I really want to welcome him to, to start his presentation. Mr. Dukas. Uh, thank you, Dino, for the introduction and the great job done coordinating the whole event. Wow, thank so you. Many important, yeah, it was great. Uh, so many important information, ideas, proposals presented. Thank you all for sharing with us. In this closing part of our roundtable, my task is to summarize and point out some of the most important issues mentioned and help all of us organize in a way that we can go directly to concrete and specific actions that can make a difference and bridge the gap. So I thought that it would be better my presentation to be organized in four main pillars. One is financial. The second one is administration and operational. The third one is educational. And the fourth one is a pedagogical pillar. 
So I will present in key points from the speaker's presentation as conclusions and also as proposals, actions, things to do. So let me start by sharing my screen. So we start with conclusions and proposals. First pillar is the financial aspects. I picked this graph so you can see what is already happening. It's uh, from Eurostat and OECD. Economic decline in the second quarter of 2020. The economic impact of the crisis has already become evident. As usual, the most vulnerable countries and communities will be affected the most. What does this create? Something that was already mentioned, that general economic decline will unavoidably affect the socioeconomic status of many households. This will have a direct impact on children's schooling. And as Mr. Piasso said, rightly fully pointed out, that families with low socioeconomic status determines to a great extent the quality of schooling. The quote from Andreas Lacher from the German manager of OECD of education is a uh, very, very describing well and illustrates well the problem. In many countries, a student's school's postal code is still best predictor for the quality of education that students acquire. So what does it happen? We have income affects performance and then performance affects the quality of schooling and the quality of schooling affects the dropout rate which rises. The numbers show that we have about, as Mr. Patinos already mentioned, Unavoidably, according to the, to the report in August 2020, the models project a future earnings gap of 11,000 at the individual level or between 10.7 trillion for the whole global cohort. In high income countries, the projected individual earnings gap is about 21,000 or between 3.4 trillion on the whole cohort. So we see a large number of declining on the income of people. So what are the proposals? How, what can we do about correcting this? First of all, we can protect education financing and coordinate for a better impact. Raise the amount spent on education, or at least don't make it lower because a country will have a, a crisis. Second, we can strengthen international coordination to address the debt crisis. Devote budgets on investing, reinventing the classroom. So spend not only in the infrastructure, but also on the professional development of the teachers. Offer special provision for the unprivileged students and provide some financial support for recovery needs, like fiscal stimulus that should go straight to school, directly to schools, and permanent support, building capacity for learning continuity in future crises. Expand the definition of the right to education to include connectivity. It is very important. We heard it from all our speakers. We need to be connected. If we are not connected, we cannot deliver the, the service, the educational service we need for our students and also for our, for our teachers. And leverage technology investments to save money and improve outcomes. You spend money at the beginning, but at the end, this money saves, a lot, this investment saves a lot of money. We heard also about very important um, initiatives, like the one that uh, Alexa presented about uh, the UNESCO coalition. These initiatives are very important and they globally offer professional development for teachers and education administrators, assistance to improve school facilities, provision of devices, tablets, laptops, mobile phones. In many countries we hear that mobile phones are a very important educational tool. Help with connectivity in areas that lack access and also do a lot of important research on education funding and try to inform people about the results of this research. Going to the next pillar, administration and operational aspects. Here we see that leadership and new ways of inspiring and managing. The role of the leader is even more important these days. And we need continuous change in legislation that creates a need of daily week seek of information. There's such a lot of workload because things are changing dynamically and the things are changing dynamically in different markets and business sectors that each affect each other. 
and they are setting the future along with the 7 to 24 work pressure makes people feel more pressure, feel more unsafe. So this workload on managers and employees has to be in some way made less. Digital Pramos users accelerates and everybody needs a good laptop, connectivity and new enhanced digital skills are needed. And also we heard that big data analytics and personal data safety is an issue in an area that creates a lot of debates because we need data in order to be able to monitor and support the educational process. But we have to have this data on a very safe and protected environment. What are the proposals on this pillar? Starting from the ensure strong leadership and coordination. We are all together in this and we, so we should support the educational leaders to be ready in order to achieve what they have to achieve. Enhance consultation and communication mechanisms. Be close to your people and create initiatives for a positive environment. Support the teaching profession and teachers readiness. Continuous professional development on an easy and tailored made way. We need to have it easy for the somebody to pick it at his own pace, at his own time, his professional development. Not put together 2000 people and train them. This is very difficult and it's an old school approach. Track and support students at risk to, to, to prevent dropout. Be close to the difficult cases and give them more opportunities and support. Strengthen the data and monitoring of your service. It's the big opportunity of measuring holistically the result of your educational service deliverable. Now, from different points of view, we can use data in order to really assess the service we're providing. Collect and evaluate the data for individual students. It's very important to have the total information about our people, about our students. Remove barriers to connectivity. There are countries that they have many barriers on connectivity. We should remove these barriers in order to be able to, to help achieve what we have to achieve. And most important, probably be fast and agile. Moving on to the next pillar. The education aspects. Here we heard from Mr. Patrinos some very important issues about the learning laws that, that it's been created. Limited capacity in place of profit distance learning and people ready to provide this kind of teaching skills. There's a weak student connectivity due to infrastructure and constrained interactions with many technical and not only problems. So we have poor attendance because of distance education, more students get disconnected from school. And he also had a very interesting theory about the differential effects. That those with lower levels of schooling will be affected by losses in income to an extent that they won't be able to cover basic needs as it. And we have education at many increase cognitive skills. Educated workers are better able to cope. And we also know that educated people seek information about jobs more easily. So it's obvious how important it is to give access to learning to all the kids around the world. It's obvious because there's no other way of the, for these children to be able to find a job in the future. So it's a, it is our responsibility as a, is education institutions to intervene and help individuals, to, no matter their financial background, to cope with these difficulties. Some proposals on the educational. First of all, we have to reimagine education and accelerate change in teaching and learning. Focus on addressing learning losses and preventing dropouts, particularly on marginalized groups. Learn beyond the classroom, anytime, anywhere learning. Offer skills from employability programs and connect with the industry and business sectors. Strengthen data and monitoring of learning. The big opportunity on creating a real personalized learning environment for every student. It was mentioned earlier, one to one. This is the time to get and organize better the one to one teaching method. Enhance uh, project based learning and mission based goals for the less privileged students. If you just send some homework and you don't see your student for a whole week, 
students get demotivated. They don't need just to receive something. They need to communicate. They need to act. And we have to support teachers in lower income countries for the professional development. They have little support. They have to be overwhelmed. They are now overwhelmed. We have to, to support them not to be confused. And create a blended system with different teaching styles where all students will be reached. It's time to gather data from the experience and move on to creating a powerful blended system where all students will be reached. And hybrid learning, as already said, can draw the best of both worlds. Sharing good practices, I believe, is very, very important. It's time for the education community to lead the way and join forces. Teachers from different countries, continents need to start working together in the creation of effective teaching methodologies and materials. Sharing materials also is very important. Moving on to the, some more educational proposals that we heard. High doses of tutoring, boost one to one, in order to connect every student. No students should be left behind. We should, have, should, we should also have just-in-time learning assessment. Assess more times on a game-based learning approach and assess to be fun and give opportunities for more tries. We don't have just one final. We should have more opportunities of assessing and creating a different kind of a assessment sentiment to our students. Production of digital content. Produce and share. Fast, easy. It can arrive to everybody. It can arrive to every teacher and to every student. And we should build institutional capacity to be able to address all these changes and challenges. Teach more ICT skills. And fully exploit e-learning platform because the nice to have teaching model of one to one with the student laptop now became a must have. And one of the major problems we hear all over the world is that we don't have a tool at home, some way to connect with the learning experience. And moving down to the last pillar, the pedagogical aspects. What we have heard, we have heard about some very important conclusions that students were stressed and anxious. And teachers life balance was also affected because teachers also parents and they had at home their kids. And at that same moment they had to take care of the kids and sometimes they were 12 months old or six months old. They should also teach. And parts of this schooling became, you know, very difficult also for parents because it became their responsibility to be close to their, to their kids and become some kind of a parental involved in the educational process, which sometimes didn't go well. And also that the change in the way students interact was also very important because students go to school not so much because of math and chemistry and, and physics. They go to school because they want to see their friends and they lost that during the pandemic. So some students got demotivated during the continuous learning methods and they, their development of social economic skills was hindered. What can we do about that? What are the solutions and the proposals? We need to use new teaching models to try to engage just our students more. Support the social and emotional needs of our students with more one to one communication and discussions, not just during the classroom, but also different, uh, different times during the day or during the weekend. Empowering teachers. We have to empower teachers and give them support and opportunities to engage in professional development, but mostly to feel superheroes because what they are doing is really difficult. And reinforce the whole child development, giving more time to values and social emotional skills and a little bit less time to the knowledge part, which they will, they will learn anyway. Reinforce the feeling of community with meetings and several team activities. Innovate, provide, and try to do long-term solutions that would create a safe and a well-organized environment to the student, the teacher, and the parent. Don't make too many changes continuously. And be flexible when planning and context is really crucial in order to be easily used by different teaching methods. We need a realistic and fair assessment due to, due to these special circumstances and feel that the system is not equal and fair because sometimes students feel that this new system is not so equal and so fair because they were used in a different kind of assessment. We have to explain pedagogically why this new kind of assessment is also equal and strong 
and fair in the new way of teaching and maintain communication with many different ways. Chat, video, telephone, live, online, one to one, one to many. My boss of all, as also Alexa said, be human. This is the basis of the whole pedagogical educational process we're discussing today. So I think it's time to grab the opportunity. COVID-19 is a threat, yet it is. But I believe, because I'm a character that I always believe the approach of the half full glass, that it's also a great opportunity. We must grab it. I approach issues in a dynamic way. And the most important, the first step we have to do is to change our mindset and declare that everything is possible and we will achieve it. Then listen to the voices of all concerned, students, teachers, parents of society, have a radar on 724. Be more open and collaborate. Share knowledge and experiences. Act efficiently with specific goals and strict milestones. Don't make too big projects and try to make micro projects that you can easily implement and see a result. And apply a 365 assessment in order to see where you stand and alter in order to progress. And having heard all this, I'm very happy today to um, to announce that Sophia, our non-profit organization, will give out for free our school self-assessment tool. We give out for free to the whole educational community all around the world. And our aim is to support any education institution to fast and easily make a self-assessment and get ideas and proposals for improvement. With this action, we hope from Sophia that we are putting a small stone to this, to this important involvement of education and transformation. Thank you very much, all of you from all over the world. Like you joined us tonight, today for somebody, you really give us the courage and stamina to continue our work and try to support education in its difficult but so much needed journey to transform for the better of our students. Back to you, Dino. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Dukas. Very inspiring uh, last words there. And uh, I think uh, what what uh, you just uh, said is amazing. I think uh, the, the, the assessment for schools uh, would be would be great. I just want to thank five people for 30 seconds and then do my own one minute conclusion. Please do the survey. It, it'll make us uh, uh, become better in what we do. Uh, we would appreciate it if you just take a moment to do that as well. I want to thank Mr. Vasilis Ikonomu for all his support, of course, for setting this up. If it wasn't for Vasilis, I think things would be much more difficult. I want to thank George Dimopoulos for all his support, ideas, and, and his push on, on making this happen happened. Uh, Yanis Kotsanis for all his uh, amazing research and contribution, as well as Tomas Angelopoulos for all his amazing points, and of course, Natasa Nika for all her amazing uh, assistance in terms of the Q&A and her attention to detail. So a quick point before I say goodbye on behalf of everyone, I want to thank the speakers, uh, Stelios Christakos, jo Alexa Joyce, uh, Nicolas Piachot, and of course, uh, Harry Patrinos, apart from Mr. Dukas, for your contributions. It's a very difficult time uh, for to take time to do these things. And I know we're all drained in some cases, but I think it was for a good cause. Thank you very, very much for being around. And just to summarize the four points, remember the problem is there and it's increasing. Uh, it's very important to, to make sure we also think about the educator and not only, of course, the school or the just the infrastructure. Very important to know that we do have tools. I think Alexa did stress that. Microsoft is doing, is doing a, a, a very, very uh, some, some, some amazing efforts in terms of solving problems for all of us. And of course, from what we heard from Stelios, that uh, governments uh, are doing a lot. And I think it's time for a great opportunity. And if all of us just do something, Change, does, change doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. And using Mr. Dukas's words, if we all just do some micro project, quick wins, I think things can happen. We have to stay positive, stay healthy. And thank you very much on behalf of everyone on this first Bridge the Gap. Thank you. Bye-bye.